What's going on guys? Welcome to another session with Franklin. Um, I came here to Nigeria, right? So I brought one of my viewers um, for full IFA initiation. It was a wonderful session. I'll probably have a separate video about that. So we've only just completed that. It took like a week. Um, one particular night, myself and the gentleman, we walked down a street in somewhere in Lagos just doing a few shopping and stuff, enjoying each other's company. These conversations started, and he told me a story. He's a medical doctor in the UK, by the way, and a lovely gentleman, this guy. And then he talked about one of his childhood friends. Now, he said, when the guy, his friend was in Nigeria, okay? Um, I think he's also in the sort of like a medical field, and after tax, on a monthly basis, he earned very close to two million naira, and that's with that's even excluding other benefits, you know, private health care and all the benefits that covered his wife and kids. Wife wasn't doing bad as well in terms of her monthly remuneration and what she brought in and all that stuff. The long and short was this gentleman told me that his friend was indeed comfortable. Oh, what? Oh, well, when Ben or where a little money baffle. So what I'm saying is, he was able to stash, he was living comfortably. Now, these other gentlemen that came on with me for IFA initiation had lived in the UK for um, about five years. And we discussed some of the identified horrors in the medical system, you know, in the UK, the, 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 the glass ceiling, the, the, the limitations, the inability to, to penetrate to even the war that you have to fight to pick on extra shifts and things like that. So he he was telling me all, all the daily microaggressions and how a lot of medical doctors, Nigerian doctors, they're pretty much, you know, skating on the thin ice and walking on eggshells and stuff. The one that caught my attention was his, the emphasis on his friend. And he said there was a time they sort of slated um, a WhatsApp, you know, phone call. And the, the, the friend was banging on about um, how he would like to transition to the UK. And this gentleman that I brought for IFA initiation, actually, is, uh, I enjoyed his company. Someone who is very, very analytical. We talked extensively about how he's already making plans to move back to Nigeria. How, you know, some of the investments he's working on, which I'm not going to go into details out of respect for him. And, you know, very, very meticulous, smart, analytical gentleman armed with a roadmap on where he's going. And his wife is also on the same page. They believe that living in the UK for them, you know, they, they strongly believe after living in the system for five years, they believe it's a well orchestrated scam. You know, they, they talked particularly about how the system is designed to, 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 to give you in one hand and aggressively rip you off, you know, and take a chunk of all of that on the other hand. And that's even excluding, you know, those that have then have family related you know, uh, dependency that, you know, in the continent of Africa. Now, back to this gentleman in question. He was talking to this guy about wanting to move back to, I mean, move to the UK and stuff. So the friend said, he said, why don't you come on holiday? Why would you come with your wife or something? In fact, come to my house. I want to be able to sit down with you, discuss the bills all the in inevitable monthly outgoings that you've got to cater to what i earn as a doctor you know my bills a full chronological order of our monthly outgoings i think that's a fantastic you know offering by anyone who lives in the system who is not trying to sugarcoat anything this is not about trying to dissuade you know you or asking you not to travel but like as i keep saying Unfortunately, many black folks, you know, Africans, unfortunately, have, a, a, um, how do I say, by default setting, a colonized mindset. It doesn't matter what they have achieved, that Elie Dumari has enabled them to achieve, how far to the top they've gone. They believe that in Africa, you've got to throw everything away and run to the land of the savior, which is the West even if they're, they're in their late 40s. By the way, this gentleman I'm talking about that came for a fine initiation, he's in his mid 40s, about 44, and um, his friend is about the same age. He has three children. Now, he said they had the conversation and he told him, 
come here. They're both from Igbo land. Come here. Come. In fact, you're welcome to come to my house. Sit. We will sit down man to man. You know, no filter, no sentiments, no bias. I will show you. We will discuss extensively. Now, all of this was to aid him to have and to be able to make an informed decision because what I gathered from chatting to this gentleman was he himself, even though he came to the UK um, as a medical doctor, was oblivious of so many things that he then, he was already neck deep into the system. He was then finding out, but by then it was too late. You just sort of get on with it. And this is the story for so many people. Now, the friend, he said they left the conversation of, at, you know, at that point and they moved on. Fast forward to several months later, several, several months later, and then he got a phone call from the man. He had sold everything, abandoned everything, bang, 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 wife and three children, moved to the UK. So when he called this guy, he was already in the United Kingdom. So the guy was like, whoa, you already in the UK? Oh, yes, uh, this, 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 da, 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 da. Now, fast forward to where the guy is right now. This is someone, when he was in Nigeria, he was doing pretty well in the medical field. He earned close to two million in a calendar month. I believe lived in his own house. He was comfortable, had all the benefits, lovely cars to drive. He got rid of everything. I don't know what happened. I, you know, what really happened. The guy said recently, this friend was begging this other gentleman that came for a fine decision, asking him if he can please loan him some money to help assist his family and about some bills and, and stuff like that. Job is not forthcoming. It layers of complexities and all of that. You see, and this man, this is his friend that came for you fight in the session is generally heartbroken. And you know, we talked extensively that night when I sat with him we, we at, and I said, This is why Franklin, figuratively speaking, runs to the top of the hill with a megaphone and I keep talking. But people who are lack the ability to to decipher and process basic information would think. The premise of my content is trying to dissuade you and all that. I cannot, for the life of me, comprehend why anyone would be willing and, and you know, to throw everything that they have built, worked hard for. Particularly, you hear 48-year-olds, 44-year-olds. In fact, there was another one, 53-year-old. This one is also fresh. He then started a factory job in the UK. Guess what? Within two months of starting the factory job, he developed a lower back problem, which has now appeared to be a permanent problem. Are you surprised? A 53-year-old. The bones are getting brittle now. The lower back problem has become really, really serious. That now, he's now having to attend multiple medical appointments. And now, the, the doctor is even saying they're contemplating and looking into perhaps an operation that he might have shifted one of his discs in the spine and it, it, it would look like the pain would be permanent for the rest of his years. He was bending and lifting stuff. He wasn't doing all this here. He had a good life and now he's been faced with problems. I'm not saying this is the case for everybody. Do you understand me? The point I'm trying to make here is why is it that Africans are willing to rip their lives to shreds? Here's another point that I want to make that this gentleman highlighted. He talked about how they have a wet WhatsApp group of you know medical practitioners and people that have similar jobs like doctors and all that. And he was talking about how even those that are due to apply for ILR, indefinite leave to remain. He, he, he took me through some numbers. I, I'll be honest, I wasn't aware of this. And how people were borrowing money. Nigerians are getting into truckload of debts, 15, 16,000 pounds. Monies they do not have to pay for applications and biometrics and all sorts and he even said if you want to file your application right to the home office say you want to apply for your ilr if you're due for it if you're you are you've applied for it as a doctor if you don't have an up-to-date papers you wouldn't be able to carry on working which would mean you would lose your job and be classified as illegal this is what he said to me and so for that reason, they are forced to then pay for expedited process, which is then, he said, even the expedited process of application, maybe same day or 24 hours, there were like three different ones, which would mean like 500 pounds per person. So if it's an emergency where 
he, the doctor has to pay for it because he needs it for his ongoing employment or him himself and the wife, it's additional 1,000 pounds. He said he has a few colleagues in their, um, in their WhatsApp group who are currently contemplating on returning their children to Nigeria so that the doctor and the wife can carry on working for now because they cannot cope on top of that, there was child care, there was all these monies. Now, he explained to me how you're able to um, make good monies in every calendar month if you work extra shifts, you know, depending on the type of doctor you are, those in the medical field would know what I'm saying, and that you pay, you know, good, they pay good money for this. He said that thing is like a war zone. Like, there's a lot of discrimination and battle involved that you apply and apply and apply for these extra shifts some hardly even get one in a calendar month. You know, some sometimes one of those might pay up to like a thousand pounds or or maybe slightly less or like a bit more and stuff that would help top up your earnings. And he said, you don't stand a chance to even get it. There's huge politics. There was just limitations and stuff. And walking on eggshells, dealing with patients and um, you have various... Um, um, managers and consultants that pick on you for trivial things and the threat and the, the fear that you might get deregistered, you might get flagged up and referred to the GMC, the battles, if, if these particular consultant doesn't like you and stuff, they might try to ring fence you and conspire. He was telling me that there are a truckload of Nigerian doctors that are getting struck off the register. And the thing about the UK is... Once you get struck off, can't practice no more. I actually asked this gentleman, I said, wait, what? I know that they happen. People get struck off for like maybe they were, in fact, genuinely guilty for their own failings. He goes, no. A lot of ring, ring face. He said, because we don't hear this in mainstream media. We don't see this on YouTube and stuff. He was telling me, because they are doctors. You know, they have their own groups. They are privy to this. That huge number of people get struck off, ring fenced trivial things the establishment comes down heavy on them there isn't money to fight it's it's so much going on you are required to keep your head down don't speak up do as you're told it's almost like a totalitarian dictatorial type of approach you it's 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 the health services in his words it's almost like a mafia those are leaving the system they know what i'm saying do you think this is designed to dissuade you from traveling this is why it's absolutely crucial. And I will always end this conversation because I'm a spiritual person. I'm an Ifa initiate. I'm an Ifa practitioner. Eshayewu. Hmm. I've heard stories of people that they were genuinely doing well in Nigeria. Genuinely being the objective word. They threw everything away. And their lives got totally destroyed in the UK. There was a doctor who got rid of his own clinic, moved to the UK, and within a couple of years, he got ring-fenced and totally lost everything. He became suicidal. I don't know where the, the person is now. Eshayewu, check if you have to fortify yourself so you do so. Do you even need? Some people have left their milk and honey in Africa. There is no way you are going to make a headway. The message I'm passing here there are endless horror stories, my brothers and sisters. And I am determined, I am rock solid determined to carry on using my voice to hopefully emancipate at least one person. Check. Do you spiritually align with where you are going? If you have in fact misplaced or ignored or thrown away your milk and honey in Nigeria, or in Africa, or any other part of Africa, where your milk and honey is designed by Elie Dumari to be, to elevate you. And then you travel to America, and you travel to the UK because everybody's jumping on the band wagon, chasing the carrot, the oppressor's carrot. You only have yourself to blame. You only have yourself to blame. There is no way you're going to make a headway. You know, I, I've realized now, I've come to a conclusion that plenty of our people, immeasurable amount of Africans travel in utter blindness and ignorance. And ignorance, they say, is not an excuse. They are totally oblivious 
of what truly and really goes on in the system. People are throwing away what they worked for only to get into the system. And to, a woman emailed me a couple of days ago and said, Franklin, myself and my husband, we threw everything away. And he said, she said, you know what, Franklin? We can't even cope to pay for childcare because of the nature of our jobs. He said, now I am forced to sit at home with the children or maybe take a ridiculous part-time job in within hours, which would mean nothing. So now we're pretty much dependent, heavily being the objective word, dependent on my husband's earnings. These are the harsh realities. There is nobody in the, in the diaspora that will sit down and babysit for you for free. No, it's a lie. Because that person that you are hoping to depend on also have to go out and go and chase their daily bread. A little bit with Each man with their own cross. Figuratively speaking. I'm telling you. So, when, when, when you throw everything away, you now get to London, you get to Manchester, you get to Birmingham. Then you realize you have young children. You are still at work. The clothes are three o'clock. A childminder has to help you pick them up, right? And then when they pick them up, they have to keep them for X number of hours. That adds up Monday to Friday. That has to come out of your wages. That's excluding your rent, your council tax, your gas and electric, your phone, your food shopping, excuse me. It's got to be a um, runny nose there. That, that excludes your outgoings. And you still want to stash something. These are the harsh realities. And there are some people that travel with three children. Oh, whoa. Please. Open your Excel spreadsheet, Microsoft Excel. Take your pen and paper. Do the calculations. This is the harsh reality. You have a nice life in Africa. You have people at your beck and call. You are the driver. You have maids. You have chefs working for you. You throw everything away. Then you are slapped in the face with reality. Everybody's got their cross to bear. I hope we can learn one or two things from this. Here's another person, here's another black man who's caught in the Western Western trap. And this cycle is so scary and dangerous. People get rid of their assets, they get rid of their investments, they get rid of their homes, their lands. We find blindly find justifications. And do you know what's even funny? A man once told me, a 56-year-old in my local barber shop, he said, Franklin, did you know that I sold my four flat, you know, four apartments house to move to the UK? He said, till date, I've not been able to rebuild the same house. He said, I can't afford to buy a plot of land in the same location because the prices have gone up. Now, is he's in his late 50s, he's struggling now to try to build a three bedroom. Hopefully, he gets to because now he's contemplating on moving back. Now, there are on the final note for the purposes of clarity, so it doesn't sound all doom and gloom. Because some people would say, Oh, yeah, yeah, this, this, I have money. So, there are people within the diaspora community that are doing well. But you see, the fact remains there is a vast number of people that are struggling at the bottom end of the spectrum compared with those that can say, oh, they're living a good life, they're enjoying themselves abroad. This is why I keep saying check so that you don't live your life in regret. There are some people, oh, one, you know, you are destined to go abroad, but you're not destined to live there permanently. There was an expiry date. Get all you can. Can all you get. Move back to the motherland and live like a god. Get all you can, can all you get. But the idea that, oh, we're going to grow old in there. And then the justification, that, oh, yeah, it's because of our children. I get it. When you do go to the West, when the children are, they live in the Westernized system. They'll leave you when you're old and gray. Not, you know, not a case of abandonment, but you'll be alone. When you're old, gray and feeble, the culture over there is different. They can't keep you in their house. When, when, when you're old, with your bones, the joints are weak and stuff, you end up in a care home. Random people who are just completing their time sheets, they will treat you like a doormat. These are things to consider. I'm not asking you not to travel abroad. My name is Franklin. It's been an absolute pleasure. Keep the conversation going on below, okay? 
Is there anything that I'm missing out on? Let's talk about it, okay? Um, on a final note, if you're interested in Ifa divination, uh, uh, which is uh, predestination checks, I do offer that service. Started in April last year. If you're waiting to hear from me, um, you're in the queue. I'll get in touch with you soon. Bang me an email. Are you looking at partnership compatibility checks and stuff like that? Do you have any questions, things you want to look into about your personal life? Send me an email to footchannel1960 at gmail.com. My email address is in the description area of this video if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Franklin as it's spelled on my YouTube channel and DM me. Uh, but I am very, very much interested in your views regarding this content, okay? Uh, keep the conversation going in the comment section and I'll catch you in the very next one. Peace and love, man. Bye-bye now. If I be well, you know.